Yeah, welcome, welcome very much to the conversation. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program here at our home, um, Peter Shea. He's in from Minneapolis, and he's got a very interesting story to tell and a, a life's experience. He does have a PhD, long one, and hard fought for in philosophy, and he's also initiated, I guess since uh, 94 or so, a television venture where he does interviews with people and he's associated himself with a number of people from the intellectual realm doing interviews with them. It's a very interesting model, and Peter, welcome so much to conversation. Really a pleasure to welcome you to New York. Maybe you could share, we like to hear, maybe share just a little bit in a brief way. You're back from born and raised, a little bit like that, a little of the education. And then we'll talk particularly about this uh, initiative that you set up that involves video, video technology, uh, out in Minneapolis and so forth, but you can share your background. I was born in North Dakota in 1951. My folks moved to a little truck farm in central Minnesota when I was three years old. So I grew up in a small town. Uh, actually, I lived in a, a very small town. I think it was a hundred, and I, we were in a farm outside it. So basically, I grew up isolated, very isolated. And over, uh, what, uh, I had a lot of time to think. And I think I became a philosopher pretty early. I, um, in high school, I had a good teacher who let, got, got me uh, reading things really early. German philosophy, stuff like that. And um, I was pretty much set on doing a kind of thoughtful life. Then uh, went to college, McAllister College, uh, uh, 1969, uh, graduated, went off to Germany with a Fulbright uh, to study with a fellow named Joseph Pieper, who was kind of the German, kind of the German counterpart to C.S. Lewis in a lot of ways, uh, kind of the comfort guy for Catholics were sort of shell-shocked from all the terrible things, the terrible challenges of the war. Uh, I came back to graduate school at the University of Minnesota in philosophy. Um, and over a period of time, kind of, I got enough education to be able to teach, and I kind of eased out of academic work. I did, I did a bunch. I did teaching stuff, but the projects I was working on kind of went cold, and my sense of myself as having competence to finish things kind of d diminished, attenuated. That, that does happen. Yeah. So I went off and did some other things. I did, I did a lot of teaching. I did a lot of public projects in philosophy. I uh, got involved with the philosophy for children movement, got involved with um, various kinds of public education programs. I, I always say the Minnesota Humanities Commission at the, uh, was, was really my, uh, my graduate school in that period. I did many grants for them, many cooperative programs. Um, and started doing video really with uh, a couple of ways. I started doing video, first of all, uh, because I was teaching business ethics and nobody wanted to listen to me. These were like vice presidents. Okay, they didn't want to listen to me. They knew more than I did about what the issues were. It was obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, but they would listen to each other. And the only really good moments in the class were when somebody told a story that everybody else had to take seriously. So I wanted that stuff in the class every time because it was the only good stuff. Uh -huh. And the only way to get it in the class every time was to bring these people back. But I couldn't bring them back physically, so I brought them back on video. And that was my first video production experience. That's it. And when did, you get when did that come to you? When, oh, what year was that? that was like 25 years ago. 20, that's a long time. Yeah, so that was my first stuff. And I, you know, I had a little bit of a grant, so I had, it was a, you know, I had a production person in a studio and a bunch of stuff that now seems to me like. Was it associated with the university at all? Were you yeah, you yeah, know, I was, I was teaching for this university and the Bush Foundation was willing to do some things to support teaching. And I made the case that uh, if you're going to teach business ethics, you have to somehow or other bring in the lived experience of people in the business.
business world. And okay. that's, that's tape I'm still really proud of. Uh, yes. Some of it I still use, even though it's, you know, it had lots of technical problems. And even though use. we have now, we're talking now in 2013 and everything like that, but even now, that use of the video technologies in order to bring uh, people's knowledge and experience, expertise, to use an overworked term, is still really important in a way that maybe it has not been realized in society in general in terms of bringing the, the world of ideas from people uh, into a wider circulation among the population. It's still, there's a lot of room for expansion in that oh, realm. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. And I keep finding things that my students just have to see if they're yeah. going to know anything. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching ethics pretty steady. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I kind of got had a little bit of a sense of what, what video could do. Mm -hmm. um, I started doing philosophy in an elementary school with some uh, it was a very poor school. The 90% the of the kids were on free and reduced lunch, which indicates their, their parents were yeah. seriously uh, below the po poverty line. Uh -huh. And but it was a very promising school. It was not, it, you didn't feel defeatist at all. It had a great principal. And I started doing philosophy with the kids. Uh, were under, you using video there at all? Um, I wasn't at the beginning. Uh -huh. That's how this came in. I started out just re doing, working with Matt Lippman's program from Montclair, Philosophy for Children, read, and some other stuff that I had found, reading stories, uh, conducting discussions, trying to train teachers, and gradually this turned into a multi-year project. It ended up being about nine years uh, before, I, before I went on to some other stuff. And somewhere in there, you were nine years at this school. Yeah, right? yeah, but not full time. But, okay, I, but I, I, see, was, I, I was coming right. back, yeah. you know, and trying things. And was that in the Minneapolis area? Yeah, it yeah. was St. Paul actually. St. Paul. Well, St. Paul, the big bluff area yeah, yeah, yeah. of, 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 of St. Paul. Uh -huh. So I had the idea somewhere along the line that if I could get the kid, get a few of the kids on television. Yes. Then they would be allies with the teachers because they would think that this stuff was really cool. And yes. so they'd be the allies of the teachers. And right. so when the teachers tried it at the school, in the classroom, everybody would be all happy about it and we'd get better. So I also thought it was important that the community know what, the, what this was. And I had this other idea, which is that Americans basically hate their kids. Uh, they might think they like them, but all the statistical evidence shows that whenever there's a an economic decision to be made, the kids end up with the short end of the stick. Yeah, there's, there's <laughs> modeling and statistics to that to show that clearly? So I, I think, I, well, that's my sense. I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know, I can't quote, uh, quote specific stuff, but over and over again, you, you see, you know, school budgets being cut, uh, programs being cut whenever something has to yeah, be but cut. Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, that's a pretty strong statement. I, I, I'm interested in that, you know, that the people hate their kids. But I mean, the thing is, it could have to do with a political context or an economic context that does not have to well, do with yeah, the emotions that are involved. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't, sort of, I mean to just yeah, leave you some room to get off the hook saying their parents hate their kids. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of if putting myself on the hook on okay, this one. Yeah, I mean, it's like, fair it's like it's, it, 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 it's, it's a strong statement, but when you look at the behavioral evidence, it sometimes looks that way. Anyhow, I had the idea yeah. that maybe if you took that seriously, that people don't have a lot of affection for kids generally, huh. partly the reason might be that they don't see kids doing anything they like very much. Uh, and, and it seemed to me, when people do, when kids do philosophy, they're, I mean, I started out doing philosophy in the schools, okay, yeah. because I didn't like kids. And my spouse wanted them. Uh -huh. And I thought, I better get to like kids or I'm going to be in trouble. So I went in and I did this stuff in the, in the classroom. And they responded and they did stuff. And I started to like them, at least the ones that could talk. What grade are you talking about? I'm what talking, age level? I'm talking fourth through sixth. I went up to That's high school. Eight through 12. Or yeah, I went 12. down. I went sometimes down to first and even kindergarten. But basically, 
four through six was my very friend. Do you think that the general thesis of yours held throughout all those grade levels and those age levels and related? By and large, when they were doing philosophy, I liked them. Uh -huh. And they were engaging. And I thought, well, if that happens to me, maybe that happens to the general public. Uh -huh. You know, maybe when they see kids doing philosophy, they'll like them too, and then they won't cut their budget so much. So uh -huh. I had this sort of funny, okay. funny okay. rationale. Okay. Yeah, right, but right, anyway, right. for about four years, yeah. I produced a show twice a week uh -huh. for St. Paul Cable called Philosophy Jams at Dayton's Bluff. And everybody had those <laughs> t-shirts. <laughs> And we would, I'd read a little story, and then we'd talk about it for half an hour, and then I'd run it to the station before I changed my mind. Okay, now wait a minute. When you were doing the video and everything, using it, that's one thing. Now you're talking about cable and distribution. Yeah, no, this was my first. The community. Well, this that, was my first. When did that start? So, well, well that is, oh, wow. That. And it was from the kids thing that you were doing that you yeah. got to cable? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The kids, and yeah. how did that develop? There was a bridge over well, Tower Park well, in there terms was of a, communicating out to the whole community rather than the classroom only. Well, it was just this, this thought that being on television was cool for these kids. Yes, guys. sure. And so I thought, well, I want philosophy to be cool because philosophy is the best thing on earth. I know that. That's, every philosopher thinks that philosophy is the best thing on earth. The it's most good to have something like your own <laughs> discipline is the best thing on earth. I like that. Yeah, and so I good, wanted yeah. those guys to think that. Yeah. The way to get them to think that mm -hmm. was, was, to, it was to make make it really cool to be a philosopher. So you get your, your t-shirts, yeah. and you get on television, and people will see you. Yeah, and you can watch the television in your home, right? and you're with your parents, and boy, that'll really put some nice juice yeah. on And, and poor, people, poor people have cable, because yeah. it's the cheapest babysitting in the world. That's interesting in itself, yeah, you're right. So anyway, well, I, when, I think, when, when did you get to where you were communicating to the broader society, rather than just in the classroom setting and uh, using television? I don't, have, I don't have my date. No, you don't Probably Probably in my it, exactly. it would have been it would have been late eighties, early nineties. Late eighties, okay. Because it was because it, yeah. it's it's continue, it's it, you know, the the shows was is the show that I I'm doing to this day is kind of continuous with this. Mm -hmm. I was for for like four years I was doing this kind of production and it was pretty interesting. Uh, you had that as a way of engaging the children within the class or something. Right. That's what right. I mean. right. Using video that's important in itself. But now you're getting into where you're going to start putting that out to the general public. Yeah. Well, as long as I was, you know, I mean, I, I only produced for cable with the kids. I don't okay. think it's, it's the, the idea was we're producing a show. It's going out to your community. Well, wait a so minute. You know, yeah. well, didn't you have some sort of relationship with video technology used in the classroom or something to bring other people? But when you're talking about carrying it on cable, you're, you're into distribution to the broader I mean, That's a different context than using it just in the classroom with a, a, a teaching aid. Well, I, you, you, know, it, it, you know, it, it seems like a big jump, but what happened was, you know, I, you know there, was a, there was a district uh, office that did video, and they had some stuff they'd lend. And so I bumbled in there and said, what can I do? And they said, oh, well, we'll lend you a camera. And, you bring us a tape, we'll get it sent over to was the that, same with company. One, was that an association with one of the cable, uh, you know, uh, the service provider? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, it was, it was, it was so in associate, association with the, with the uh, community access uh, enterprise that had been set up when whatever cable provider in St. Paul got its monopoly. Okay, you now, know. you use, I want to get yeah, straight right. to because we're in what they call public access. Yeah, this is the same, with, the same with thing. With that station that you went with the programming to the community, with that, uh, so you call it community, sometimes that's you, but with that like part of the public access capability that yeah, was right. booming across the country. Right, exactly, world. it was exactly okay. the same, so you're same public, thing. You're, you're yeah. a public access guy. Yeah, yeah, right. I was, I was well, working with... Manhattan with Neighborhood Network, yes, public exactly. access for Manhattan. Yeah. This, was, this was St. Paul Neighborhood Network, which okay. was public access for St. Paul. You didn't know a guy named Tony Riddle, did you? Never knew him. Okay, okay. But I only worked through the... See, the schools were one feeder. Yes, say. right. Okay. And so there was a public school office that supplied a certain amount uh -huh. of programming uh -huh. to community access to St. Paul Neighborhood Network. Uh -huh. And I worked with the guys in the public school and were very nice to me and mentored me along. Okay. And they and they got the they want they were hungry for material. Uh -huh. And everybody they were dealing with uh -huh. uh, was doing, you know, like 
uh, 30 minutes and they'd fuss and fuss and fuss and fuss. And yeah. I was doing 30 minutes twice a week, yeah. no fuss, I delivered them a tape. Yeah. And so I became their biggest producer. Because uh, you were dependable, right? Yeah. And, and it was all, I mean, I had a good volunteer who showed up one day and said, I want to do video. I'll do any amount of video you want. Uh -huh. uh, and Boy, that's he, bad. Yeah, and yeah. So, so he ran the camera uh -huh. and handled the technical stuff, and I just sat in front of the background he made and uh -huh. uh, and did my show and more. I, I, I and handed out the T-shirts, you know. Handed out T-shirts and did a rip. Yeah, I did a little rip, but, yeah. but but I basically didn't do much intro. Were you doing much by way of comedy or using comedy or you're very personable? Well, it was so a forth. funny, you know, yeah. there was funny stuff, but yeah. basically I show up, I say, welcome to Philosophy Jam to David's Bluff, uh, here are the kids and we get their first names, and then I'd read a little story, like two minutes, uh -huh. and then I would say the magic words, what's worth talking about, uh -huh. and hands are raised, I had like six people and with kidney shaking. It was all spontaneous. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no nothing, I, I, I've never done scripting. Yeah, right, right. So we had these, these kids, like three or four on one side, three or four on the other, they'd all raise their hand, I'd pull the microphone out, yeah. and they say their thing, and then I'd try to kind of pull it together, and after a half hour we'd quit, we'd run about, we'd, every taping we'd run about four, Shows. Did you used to try and have a theme for that half hour or anything like that? Or did no, you I never did it. Or did you I think never did. The top? It was yeah. the, spontaneity was a large part of what you wanted to achieve. Well, spontaneity, yeah. I was lazy. It's, okay, it's, it has right. nothing to do with, with gold. It has yeah. everything to do with colossal laziness. Yeah, I, I, wanted, I, I, I walked into that school. I went to the went to the classrooms. I asked the teacher, what six kids do you want to get rid of today? <laughs> I marched them down to the classroom that was, this, that was set up to do the taping, mm -hmm. sat down, opened the book, and thought, I wonder what story we haven't done. Oh, oh let's try like this. this. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like that. There yeah. was no plan. Sometimes I did the same story four You'd times. You'd be great as a jazz man to do a freeform jazz, you know, yeah. with another player. Let's get on the stage and wail. Yeah, well, that yeah. was the way I, it, well, that, it was that loose. And yeah. I, I knew that this stuff worked. I'd done mm -hmm. it in classrooms for years. I yeah. knew that if you read this material, mm -hmm. and I, I had really good material, yeah. you uh -huh. read this material, two-minute story, uh -huh. the kids will not stop talking. Well, that's really, so, and you're talking now between the ages, let's say, generally about eight or nine through maybe 12, 13 or something. Something like that. that. Junior it was, high school. Well, it wasn't up to junior. I did junior high, I did, I did some junior, I did some senior high stuff later. I, I actually missed junior high largely. But these are like fourth to sixth grade because this is an elementary, okay, elementary that's, school. That's about nine to ten years old. Yeah, nine right. to fourth to sixth, so yeah. nine to twelve. Something like Pre that. I, I, did, I never knew. Yeah, but pre puberty. The key. Pu pre uh, that's important. Yes, yeah, so puberty you got a whole other thing. Right. Like all I, 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 whenever I went into a new school, yeah. I had lots of schools. I'd go up to the, I'd find a teacher that, who, who, who I could talk to, yeah. and I'd tap her on the shoulder and say, Where's puberty this year? Yeah, right. right. I mean, when my dad was teaching sixth grade, puberty was at sixth grade. Yeah. Was was actually at seventh grade. So yeah. he was he was at the pre-puberty yeah. uh, miracle. It moved down to fifth. It's probably down to fourth now. Uh -huh. Yeah. But but it differs by school. But if you if you can catch him just pre-puberty. Yeah. Beautiful things happen in uh -huh. discussion. So I, I I did do and I basically I do just whoever the teachers. Sam was a mixture of kids they really wanted out of the room yeah. and kids who they thought were really pretty good. Yeah, and Freud thought there was a latency area around six, you know, and everything. But anyway, yeah, that's that's it. It's really interesting. You did all that and it worked really well. What? How did you select the story that you were going to read two minutes? Where did you select that from? Well, and wasn't it important to have a piece of uh, something that really had some meat to it? Not only just in terms of the way you and I might think about really important questions. But one that could relate to the consciousness of the young consciousness. Oh, I'm glad you asked that. Well, I mean, in, in what, 78 or so, I got trained uh, by Matt Lippman and Adam Sharp in a technique called Philosophy for Children. And they just, oh, okay. they just they, he was a Columbia prof who, who, who kind of transplanted to Montclair State where they uh -huh. gave him a kind of uh, enterprise, uh -huh. they gave him an institute. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a bunch of, of novels for kids, uh -huh. which were ways of doing philosophical inquiry with young kids. 
I uh, eventually had about, oh, I know, eight, seven, eight of these things. You only know, had a two minute piece you read. That yeah, would be yeah well, that was his standard. Yeah, yeah there, was, there were novels. There were exceptionally yeah. boring novels, by and large, but they had great, inform, great ideas in them. Okay. And, and, and the way that the, the, the teaching technique, always the same, was you read a little excerpt, or you have the kids read it, right. and then you have enough copies. Uh -huh. And then you ask the question, what's worth talking about? Uh -huh. And they'll find things because there's a lot in these. That's really interesting. I think that's true in, in, in human communication like that. But yeah. when I was a kid, like, or we're going back to yeah. the dark ages and all that, we used to have like the Hardy Boys, or we had Nancy Drew, and they had certain stories that were read that would get around. And now it's Harry Potter or something like that. It has great you know, circulation among youthful people. But, yeah, okay, anyway, I'm just yeah, well, yeah, and then there's, there's a lot that could be read or drawn from. There's a, the genius of these things is that there were a ton of ideas in each little tiny six segment. Yeah, right. And okay, they, yeah. they kind of packed them. Uh -huh. So uh, the other thing that I worked a lot with, you know, Matt Lippman did one whole enterprise of philosophy for children. Uh -huh. And quite independently, uh -huh. or almost independently, Gary Matthews at the University of Mass Amherst uh -huh. was working on another uh -huh. line, and he was working with classical children's literature. Okay. Arnold Lobel, yes. for example, okay. big, was a big deal for him. Uh -huh. and, uh, and he was finding ways of using that. So I kind of combine the two. Sometimes I do Arnold Lobel Frog and Toad stories. Sometimes I do Matt Lippmann's curriculum novels, uh -huh. always only about two minutes. I read it. I usually try to choose things for on the air mm -hmm. that I'd done enough times in the classroom uh -huh. that I knew they would work. And I also want, I did, was doing a little research too. I wanted to, to get documented how some of the ways the children take tracks through this material. And that process while you were engaging yeah. with the children, was, was that something that you enjoyed doing? Oh, it was the most fun I had. Really? It was also the highest level philosophy I was doing. Yeah, I mean, you put, you put a trust in the, the wisdom of the ch children. The, well, the children, the children are asking really good questions and addressing things and everything. Yeah, yeah. Good. The children good. are natural philosophers. I, yeah, I mean, that's that, that, that's something one could one could think, but you have to see it proven exper experientially. Yeah, enough yeah. times, mm -hmm. and it doesn't much matter where the poverty line is. Mm -hmm. People who have never learned standard English and who live in conditions that turn my stomach, yeah, yeah. somehow when they sit down and talk about uh, ideas, uh -huh. lights go on you wouldn't believe. I yeah. don't know why it happens. It shouldn't happen. I think Kids should true. not be as good as they are. Uh, it's, I, it's a miracle, but I, it, it does happen. Yeah, I do agree with you. I don't know. I th I've always thought, I'm not so sure because I'm, I'm sort of, I had kids of my own who were married. And I want to get back to your wife, too. You said you were married and, and that. But anyway, that's personal. But I've always thought like five-year-olds, five and six-year-olds, are just so gorgeously honest. They're just honest. They have no artifice at all. They'll believe and go with and flow with everything. They got a spontaneity that is just like my favorite human beings almost are those five and six year olds. And oh. you were relating to some of them. Why well, didn't go that, that young? They're too smart for me when they're that young. <laughs> my, my, my son, who, yeah. uh, this is pretty funny, my son, uh, you know, when he, you know, going through three, four, five, uh -huh. was saying things, and I'd write them down. I'd get, it, I'd, I'd write an email to Gary Matthews. By that time, was a, I mean, he was a very substantial guy. Yeah, I mean, right. he was, he was an uh, August, you know, an Augustine scholar, a medieval uh -huh. scholar, big deal guy. And I'd write these things, that, you know, send these things to him, yeah. and he'd put them on the board for his graduate seminars. Well, you know? <laughs> did, 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 were you getting videotaped? I wasn't. I, that, that that was I, I, I've fallen or? down very badly in one respect, which is I have not taped my own family, uh -huh. uh, and so you know either my. Well, that was a problem. No, yes, you, yes, you, you were really taping was. these interactions with the children in the school. You but know? I wasn't wasn't taping at home. But well, I, no, but I know, but you were taping in the school. Yeah. Why weren't you taping at home? Well, partly because my spouse didn't want to, want it to yeah, happen. Well, you well, know, well. for one thing, mm -hmm. it's not that it, you know. Every bit of mess shows up in the background. That's true. That's true. And, and, and the kids, and were, and the kids were not particularly eager to be 
victims of uh, of, of my video enterprises. Yeah, it them. is intrusive. Yeah. yeah. So so, yeah, so right. whenever I took out the camera and try, tried to try to take my kids, in, no, no, no. Did no, you no. ever do any you know home videos of them coming down the hill on a sled or no? No, I, I, I don't know. think that a lot I, of people do. I do, didn't do that. I mean, partly it's the camera is not an outdoor op. Well, I gadget don't, I for don't, me. Yeah. For that me, would, those <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, I don't want to carry it. I want it to stay on a tripod. Yeah. I want it to stay. I, I basically don't even do two shots. I do one shot yeah, steady. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. So two. You know. No. I. I, where, I, I missed that. Yeah. All. Well, you had. You. Where, where along the line had you picked up the PhD? Had you done? I hadn't your, picked up a PhD. This is. You were funny. still working on it. There well, I wasn't exactly even working on it. I. I, you know, there were projects that had gotten old for me, or I did a wall, and I didn't know what else to do. So I was continuing to journal and continuing to think about them and continuing to teach. Yeah. But the PhD was a sort of desperate, painful feature of my life. Do you like to write? Do you like the writing? Or Sometimes. You didn't get a I've been block. away from it a little. I, well, I, no, I, I cured my writer's block. Okay. I, I don't have one of those anymore. Oh, uh, you did have it at the time? I, I had, well, I, well, I suppose it, in a way, it wasn't so much, that it was, I mean, the writer's block could be said a lot of different ways. What was happening, basically, was that I was writing miserable, convoluted, unreadable stuff, and I sort of knew it. Like and so, I, so, I mean, it was properly blocked. It, was, it would have been much better if I had, it had been much worse if I had not been blocked yeah. and it produced, you know, 5,000 pages of this garbage. It would have sounded like, sound like James Joyce or something. Or James no, Joyce. no, if I could have done James Joyce, that would have been nice. This no, sounds like would, the worst would, academic prose so in you the were, world. So you weren't, you weren't going with long run-on sentences that go on for pages and pages like Faulkner or something like that. You I, were it wasn't, I don't know. I've, things or that, you know? I've even forgotten my yeah. old style, but I, but I thought I pretty much cured that. Uh -huh. I, I got to the point where I could write decent prose. Grant proposals Did you help. write declarative sentences? Well, I, I always had to clear. I mean, I, I had to grammar right. It was just so blanched and complicated. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, newsletter writing helped. I did some publications that helped. Right. Um, and um, a lot. I think I think all this conversation helped. Surely. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But I and journal stuff helped. Uh, I did some public stuff. Uh, you know, some stuff for general audiences now and again. That helped pretty much. Anyway, I, I got that cured. Yeah. But, I, but, I, but my projects were still kind of dead-ended, and it, and it took a kind, of, a kind of restart years later. Actually, the video stuff played into that. Yeah, maybe it helped you keep you into restart. You know, well, like restarting a computer can clear a lot of problems. Well, here's how it worked with the thesis. I, I had a very, very huge Project, which I, I think is probably the only project in applied ethics, uh, the only thing really worth doing. Uh, but I'll be grandiose about it. Yeah, but it was ahead. huge. Yeah. It was huge, and there was, and, and of course, theses cannot be huge. They yeah. have to be tiny. Yeah. And then I began thinking about the stuff I was doing with interviewing uh -huh. and why it was important to me. And I realized that the rationale for for doing interviews was not one that could be stated very easily in right. philosophic language. Okay. The importance of what you do and what I do yeah. could not was not kind of obvious, and it wasn't well understood or well taken account of in philosophic ethics, but it was, in fact, ethically important. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a, a thesis in, uh, eventually, after I'd, after I'd been doing all these conversations, after I'd moved from the children to the next phase, which was, I lost contact, lost kind of access to kids, and began doing one-on-one -on -one stuff with adults. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's when I, you I, began, had, I began to think about that, and I began to think about its importance. And the okay. thesis turned it came out of, uh, you know, came out, out essentially as the rationale uh -huh. for that activity. Well, uh, shifting in media. For one thing, you, I don't know if you ever read any McClellan or anything like that. I looked at it. I looked at it, but I didn't study. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, we used to visit with. Spring in the 68, 71, and everything. And he said that hot and cool medium in literature, in literature, the written word was the kind of thing that was the basis of Western civilization, phonetic literacy. And we were coming into a multimedia world. 
we're coming into a multi-sensorial medium, and you were making the shift from a linear-based kind of way of laying out language and thinking and thought and what's rational and all kinds of major assumptions, philosophically important, to one where here comes the internet over the horizon, here comes the multimedia. There's a whole chip in the media mix that is uh, characteristic of the way he saw that. He, we cite James Joyce and so forth. But you were coming into touch with multimedia as opposed to linear uh, perception that was characteristic of uh, uh, the phonetic alphabet and the, and the language that was normally been conveyed since Gutenberg. And he had a book, the Gutenberg Galaxy, that was an amazing tour de force about the media ratios of communication. And you were making that transition toward television, particularly as you began to start distributing it in the cable systems in Minneapolis. Perhaps, I don't know, it's just a thought. Well, it, there, there was, you know, I mean, the, it, the, the world's world. going through that transformation. However it happened, I don't know how it happened, mm -hmm. um, I, the, the, the stuff I was doing with video became very important for my intellectual life. That is, Good for you. Yeah, that is, the fact that I was doing video yeah. and, and putting it out to a general audience yeah. and, and the, the audience that I had once I started doing individual interviews was like a million people. Well, almost that's were really asleep. That's a, that's a large number. Well, they're all asleep. Well, you know, it's, mid, it's midnight. But if they were awake and tuning into my, to, tuning into my show, there would have been a million of them. Well, maybe uh, I could introduce the fact that you're known as the bat of Minerva. Yes. Now, yes. how did you happen to become up known? Your whole uh, video entity is called the Bat of Minerva. Maybe you could share that with well, us. It, it's it almost to the time in which you did it, and also uh, oh. something of Nietzsche's or somebody. No, so, well, let's okay. First of all, let's take the story from philosophy for children to the to the, the, the yeah. things I'm doing now. Yeah, right. Um, um, at the end, after after some years of doing philosophy with kids, yeah, a little discussion. I wanted to continue with kids, but it became harder to get permissions and harder to get the right kind of access to a school to do that. Really? And so I began looking around for some other ways of continuing this conversational mode. Yes. And, uh, hap and decided to try doing the same kinds of conversations with adults. Okay. And discovered kind of by accident that I could buy uh, a half an hour of time on a regional channel. Okay, and that's not public access. It's still public access, it's public but it's access. region. But it, but but you're paying to be on it. Okay. It's essentially, producer supported uh -huh. public access. Okay. Part of the deal that the Minneapolis communities made with their monopoly cable providers. That's what we might have called leased access. Or so, yeah. so 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 the idea was there there may be all these different local. Community access. You can buy a brand to get it to a region. But then, yeah, but then yeah. there's got to be one place where the county commissioners' meetings uh -huh. go out. Uh -huh. And that'll get every, they'll get the seven county metro area. You Again, get, Minneapolis. Yeah, St. Paul. St. Paul and the suburbs. Right. And um, it'll Major be in a, on a low number in the on the dial, uh -huh. prime real estate. Yeah. So Channel six, six, was, six right. right. Yeah, right so yeah. I said, oh, you know, I got, I got a half hour on six, and it cost me five hundred dollars because it wasn't for a program or for five, a season. Five, five hundred dollars a season, five hundred dollars a year uh, for uh, twelve thirty to one. That's pretty uh, reasonable, you think? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you better. So I got my bookstore, a yeah. bookstore to sponsor me, and Good from one you. day to the next, I had a show. Due to start in two weeks. Uh -huh. So the question was, what do you call well, it? Well, I wanted to camp up the idea of it being dark and midnight and so forth. So I needed a kind of suitably dark name. Well, so bats are kind of dark. And I was they remembering the, the, the line from Hegel with the, oh, Hegel. the the owl of Minerva only flies at dusk, which I've always mm -hmm. taken to mean that philosophers don't really change the world. They just stand on a high hill, watch the battle, and then swoop down to shoot the wounded after <laughs> after we're done. You know, this is this is and it, which is not a really good commercial for philosophy, right, right, if you right. know what I mean. Yes. And uh, so I said, okay, let's uh, fool around with that. I mean. Minerva's fine, but maybe some other ants. I look too much like an owl. Well, as I get older, I look more like an owl. I don't want to be, be an owl, okay? Yeah, right. yeah, right. So what, and oh, like, I, what about bats? I mean, yeah. they're really good yeah. in low light. They're really successful. Mm -hmm. they're, 
they're friendly, they, they, they cluster in a million, uh, millions of bats together. Uh -huh. There are a lot of different kinds of them. Um, mm -hmm. They are really good for us. They eat all kinds of things. They make guana? Yeah, you know, they're, they're, they do go. I didn't wow. go that yeah, way yeah, with yeah, the guana. Yeah, but, yeah, okay, you know, but, okay, the, okay. but the eating the mosquitoes, yeah. the bats, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good philosophical animal. Uh -huh. uh, and and, and as, you know, as, as, as the thing progressed, I thought more about it. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad, a bad image mm -hmm. uh, for, for philosophy. Uh, uh, I, I think philosophy is, you know, should be on the edges between light and dark, and should be able to kind of make sense of uh, phenomena that aren't coming well into focus yes. otherwise. Yes. So it seemed like a good image. I like, I've liked it since then. Uh, so anyway, I called the show the Bat of Minerva. And there's yes. a site to that effect, right? What? There's a site. There, there, we are websites. Numbers of websites. Did yeah. I the Bat of Minerva? Yeah. Okay, good. So you can look it up in Google. They can look yeah. up your yeah. name with Bat of, and it will come up with all Yeah, Bat of Minerva is a, is a unique identifier, I think. If you get, yeah. uh, it'll pick up me. Yeah. And I've had very few few others were many websites. And there weren't very many people take that. That's very idiosyncratic to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was kind of lucky. It was before yeah. the internet, before yeah. the internet got going, that, yeah. that, that I chose it. It turns out to be. A, a name that, is, that that uniquely identifies me and nobody else wants. And you've so. more recently become involved with an institute at, of advanced studies at the University of Minnesota, oh. where you're talking with intellectuals or professors and so forth. So maybe we can move it along. Oh, well, that'd be so fine. Forth. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so I for I started out. I, I'm chicken. Okay. You're, I want to talk to people, but I I'm chicken about talking. You know, cold calling very important people. You aren't. You call all kinds of guys. I try anything. Yeah, but, but, but I was, you know, I, I'm scared of rich people. I'm scared of powerful people. I'm basically somebody who grew up in a little tiny, you know, farm. Near and, Fargo, North Carolina. Well, I, no, no, no. I grew up, grew up in central Minnesota. But, yeah, okay, yeah. So I'm kind of a chicken. And yeah. So um, I do people I meet at parties. I become a dangerous person at parties. I don't go to many parties. Mm. But there's usually somebody there with a story. Yeah. I do my family. Mm -hmm. I do the people at church. Mm -hmm. I do the people at my spouse's church. And is it all just spontaneously deciding you can talk to most anybody? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah it's just anybody who didn't scare me too much would seem to have a story. You don't have any overall theme or purpose or something like that. Good conversation and civility. You I, seem to be ready made for what, let's say in the jazz world, for what would be called free form jazz. Oh, yeah. You I just sit down and wail. The, influ the influence wasn't there, but it was the comparable thing. My big influence was not jazz, huh? but but the theatrical improv. Improv, well, that's the yeah, same, 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 same thing. I, mean, I, I took those yeah. classes. I loved them. Uh, I, and that was the only thing I really wanted to do. Uh, I, I never wanted to script anything. It was actual work. So is there anybody that you wouldn't talk uh, Would you be willing to sit down and have a conversation? Or are you call, there's a, I would submit. I call my program conversation. I would submit conversation is different than an interview. Mm -hmm. An interview bespeaks more structure, a form, a, sis, a list of questions you're going to follow, boom, 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 boom. It's more linear. Right. Okay? A conversation is more free form. We have a friend of ours lives in this building, Ornette Coleman. He's a famous for being freeform. People get, you got a trumpet, I got a trombone, we get up and, and we wail. We do, it bespeaks spontaneity more than a structure. And there's a difference between, in philosophical terms or immediate terms, between a structured thing where you're following one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one where it's just sort of growing like topsy as you do it. You we're kind of mixed, I mean? we're, we're kind of, we're, I'm kind of a funny mix, okay? okay. So yes, I think you are. You so have a great sense of humor. You could do shtick in comedy clubs. Have you ever thought of doing that? Getting I started? have indeed, have but I haven't one? ever gotten myself. You I, have that I, I only do. I only do stand up in front of Catholic congregations. <laughs> but look, well, there's a lot of them. You know, I mean, look, you have a pretty good audience built in. Now, my interview style is something in between here. I don't have a set of questions, mm -hmm. but I do give my guests a good long time to talk. Before I open my mouth, at least this is what I've been, what I've I've come to after a lot of years. Uh -huh. And at the end of eight ten minutes of somebody telling me who That's they are, a long time, yeah. then I know mm -hmm. I know what to do next. 
Uh -huh. I've heard I've heard where their voices get enthusiastic. Uh -huh. I've heard the details they mention. Yeah. That, that people are real revealing. The bird minutes. is on the wing. Yeah, yeah. and so fine. I can just and, and if I remember what what they are, and I do remember. Mm. I can go back and I can go back and, and get get sixty minutes out of anybody. Yeah. But you asked about how the Institute for Advanced Studies yeah, well, came I, to be, and that's that, that's even that's something you're engaging in at the moment. Right. And right. For some right. Well, 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 here's the deal. I was starting with these with just. Anybody, I, and, and then every so often somebody would sponsor for me, you uh -huh. know. And so when they sponsored, then I would be nice to them, and I would go in their direction. By sponsoring, you get some money. Send some, you know, because my my, my bills went up fifty five hundred dollars a year. Well, that's not very much. But, 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 you know, okay, well, well, it was five hundred the first year, a thousand the second, oh, then 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 and it, it's kept going it up kept like that. It's, it's okay. about it's close to five thousand dollars now. Okay. Uh, so for that regional, outreach. yeah. It was still, still the best bargain in the world, but yeah. it's pretty, pretty um, pricey. Yeah, so, right. so would, do you think by going to that lease thing like that with a thousand five hundred, that you got out of the realm of what is called public access? Oh, I know it's still public the access. Of public it's access is can be done for no cost at all. Right. It's high end public access. Yeah, it's, high end. You public, know, it, but below public television. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the thing. There's a yeah. continuum, and, conti and public television has a continuum too. But these, yeah, these right. are people who are putting enough money in that they get the production values up. Yeah. Usually, it's people who want to either sell religion, yeah. or painted ducks, a lot of them, or yeah. chiropractory, yeah, right. or things like that. And the they, rental dysfunction is a lot of that. Yeah, so they they do these they do these things, and they put some money into it. And they make it, and they make it look pretty good, so that the station as a whole is pretty watchable. Yeah. Um, and they come in with uh, right time frames and everything. Right, right, right. Sure. That. It's sure. all structured. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, there was a, a, yeah. uh, that was a ball field I wanted to play on. Uh -huh. uh, the way it ended, I ended up to, with the institute was fairly was sort of like this. After a lot, bunch of years of kind of catching guests as I could, uh -huh. I got to the institute and. I just sort of, I knew this thing existed, I went to talk to them, and they, and so they gave me some guests, I did the director, and the assistant director, and then I did some guests that they had, and then I came to them and said, you know, you really ought to fund me, because you need to do some outreach, okay, now, and this yes. is easy outreach. Okay, back up a little bit, the Institute of Advanced Studies. for, for Advanced Studies, studies. which was a, a new institution at the Only University of Minnesota. Four or five years. No, we all knew it was new as in ten years, and I came into it. I came into it when it was all so pretty ten well years established. Ago they set up an institute, part of the University of Minnesota, that is part of their overall structure, which is called the Institute of Advanced Studies. Yeah. It deals mostly with the humanities and things. It's it has some science and arts components, strong arts components, but it, it's broadly humanities. And it's kind of, it, it's a way of supporting junior faculty who are writing their books. Well, only and, junior faculty? Well that's, that, well, that's a big piece of it, is, is supporting, you know, people, you know, supporting fellowships for junior faculty who need a semester off to write a book. If you had a Nobel Prize winner on the faculty there, they wouldn't have uh, object to you doing an interview with that. No, no. Well, but, but, well sure, because of the other wing of it is, yeah. is, you know, faculty seminars exploring some topic, and they, People apply and they get money and then they can invite the biggest people yeah, they know. Yeah, that opens up uh, grant getting from other institutions. Yeah, oh yes, exactly. They, they, across the so society. they become they become a major grant writer. That's yeah, another thing. Right. So it's a kind of it's the place where the exciting, sophisticated, cutting edge stuff yeah. gets housed and facilitated. And you do interviews with individuals, and I think that's becoming more important. And are these kind of things opening up in academia across the... I'm talking about academia and the professorship and so forth, accessing the uh, outside of the classroom kind of a thing, accessing the people as people that are an important part of the faculty of a university or an educational institution, is, is using video. Is that becoming something that's likely to grow? Well, I think, I think it should grow, but I don't know whether it is. I mean, I just I just got back from trying to introduce that idea at the College of William and Mary, uh, and, and I had some pretty good response there. I, I, I don't know how big a deal it is. How, how about if you were taking that, if you could, let me just share, because uh, we're in a similar thing, kind of, yeah. in a way, except I'm just out in public access uh, and so forth, and we've done a lot of people, and they have a thing in England, and what you're talking about is a different way of introducing 
academic or intellectual fair. And so and in England they have a thing, they it was very class conscious in England. You know, Ox came, you know, Oxford, uh, Oxford and Cambridge, only a few people go to university. After the Second World War, they started a thing called Open University, it's called. And they used video as part of it, the, the professors and so forth that were part of the Oxbridge you know, uh, hierarchy, or you know, leading scholars and so forth. And, that would, and uh, they were going to use television as a teaching thing, that is, televising programs. They have courses that they use television. And you could say, let's just stay out of the blue. Uh, if somebody's a behavioralist, you got B.F. Skinner. So he's got the horse's mouth on his behavioral thinking. You get the best mind, and then you put it up on the satellite feed or something, and it could come down. And so you've got the best mind in any particular field that could become available to the general society. We tried to introduce, or we helped try to help. That was started by uh, uh, the, the certain people in England and so forth. They were trying to institute it here. And the problem came, and that's maybe beyond where you're using some of the intellectual leadership as content for your program where it could become available to greater numbers of people in the field of philosophy or whatever, or art or whatever. Oh, well, yeah, well, but wait, let me just finish it. So they get to that, and the, 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 we tried to do it in terms of public, or encouraging public television and that sort of thing, and the people who objected more than anybody else were the professors who were in the universities in the United States because they didn't want to have their authority undercut by the leading authority in the field. So do you understand what I'm yeah. saying? But the, the use of letting the best minds in the various fields become available, rather than having to listen to somebody who's going to talk about the ideas as they see it of the best minds. And if you understand that might oh, be yeah, a problem yeah. or a way we yeah. could introduce leadership, intellectual leadership to the wider society. Yeah, well, Here's you're, you're, you're singing very much my song. I mean, okay. I, want, I mean, look, I have about 230 interviews up now. I mean, I mean yeah. the institute introduced me to people, and I taped anybody they, they let me take. They tell you who, or they... No, they you? never tell me anything. Uh -huh. I, okay. I, 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 I take no orders. But they recommend people, and I almost always take the recommendations. And you're taking because they're people splendid. from the university that they represent. I'm so what if the university down the hall, uh, down the road, that's got a Nobel Prize winner, and he's got an afternoon on a Sunday he can go out and do and a real thing I want to go hunting for. I can go hunting you for. Can. And the university brings in visitors of, of the first rank. And they and the institute will confront it for me. So they'll say they'll say to the to the guest, "Would you like to be a, a member? You know, a, a guest on the show?" Well, that's something it, that they can be bureaucratically tied into and functionally tied into a particular individual. But what if you and I got somebody out of the general society that uh, is not part of their faculty or any tied into them? Would they support you? Oh, the they have. Process? Yes, absolutely. So you can select whoever you want. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They said they've selected. They've supported the craziest stuff. I mean, really? you know, I'm I surprised. Mean, I mean, I, you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I go hunting. I mean, this this New York trip is yeah. a hunting trip essentially. Uh, I go hunting. You know, you yeah. know, I I wanted to do I wanted to do art faculty at William and Mary. They'll post that. Uh -huh. I want to do. Some students, a student of mine who's in a graduate program at a teacher's college uh -huh. at Columbia, they'll support, they'll post that. Uh -huh. They're, you know, now they trust me, they'll post pretty much what I do. And if the University Institute of High, that sounds like Princeton, University of Advanced Studies. Yeah, 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 I did a program with Buckminster Fuller, the great college, back in 1974, when all this stuff was just getting off the ground. And it was his thought about higher education that all of our institutes of higher education will become primarily video production facilities in order to get the best thought done with editing, but it had to be approved, the intellectual integrity to be approved by the person who's got responsibility for it. And this is the way we're going to educate the public in that. Do you think the universities are moving toward becoming uh, a, a production centers on large scale? And is there room for advancement, particularly along the lines of what you've been pioneering, if I may, in terms of this, this very interesting mi media mix that's part of the educational process writ large? Well, I think it is fascinating. And I'm just at the edge. The of leading of, Yeah, the, I'm, right. I'm just at the edge of a major experiment in the 
this direction. Okay. I don't know whether I can pull it off, but you want to share I, it I have a secret. Oh, well, there's no secret. Well, no, you we don't do secrets. Do a little, you give a little hint of what it is well, you're thinking of. Well, look, uh, Listen, everybody in this my... doc is trying to do massive online free courses. Uh -huh. You know, the biggies like Harvard and MIT have these things out. MIT has all their fa all their, their notes online. Yeah. Free. Yeah. So so They're this this back idea back. of of just putting a massive course out to tens of thousands of people is for some reason has has, has caught on and the University of Minnesota doesn't know quite, quite what this is, I think, but they'd like to try it. And so I'm in the process of trying to produce a model that would make use of the stuff that I've done. Yes. I've got about 230-ish interviews posted. Yeah. And yeah. also the stuff the Institute has done, which is, you know, they keep everything they do, which are the public presentations. They do scholars and things stuff. like that. And that's thousands of hours of right. stuff. Okay, it's a lot of So yeah. what, is it, what, what would it be like to use that stuff to produce a, an online course that could be offered free um, in the, on the topic of the lives of creative and thoughtful people? Well, okay, I think that's more or less their mission statement, isn't it? Or is that where yeah, it's along I, those terms? I, yeah, I think yeah. so. And but why a course? Why does it have to be a course? Why can't it be a video a program? They have the Science Channel and other things you can get on cable now. They have really interesting physics and things like that, and they can be accurate. They can have a and they can educate with graphics and everything. It can be a great educational tool. Well, but well, there's a bias against multimedia by the academic and intellectual community because they're all specialized out in the special fields. Well, there may be a bias in the general university, but Curiously, there's not a bias in the people I'm working with. Okay. They embrace this stuff with open arms, and they're yeah. already doing what you're talking about. That is, my show, which is basically the scholars at the University of Minnesota and the people they bring in, yeah. and anybody else I can find, That's marvelous. is going out under sponsorship from the University of Minnesota yeah. to a million people at midnight. Yeah, so they have, okay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I understand, I've not been there, I'd like to, my daughter's there on faculty. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, I understand, Minneapolis is a really happening place, particularly in the arts. Yeah, it's and, really a real yeah. cultural art. But now, now the next step is to take that material that's, up, that's now available, and we're getting a tremendous number of video downloads uh, Every month, that's off the institute. Of uh, from, from the website, where, those are, where are they? On your website yeah, or the institute? It's website. the institute's website. It's the Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Minnesota. If you want to see it, search "Bat of Minerva" and it will show up. Okay. The, now, this the, gentleman is the Bat of Minerva. <laughs> flat, yeah. flat, flat, flat. Anyhow, mm -hmm. if the idea is we get get these these. We have this material. One thing to do is just put it out for people to find, either to find at midnight mm -hmm. or to find online. But the other thing to do is to try to weave it together. In Thank you. Experience. Thank you. And also cross culture, this thing called systems thinking, where you're dealing with pattern recognizing is what's coming out of the exponential increase of the video, of media. And what you can do is represent patterns between all of the aspects of an overall reality, which is, has something Bingo. to do with philosophy. Bingo. Right. You, you know, so so how what what makes the difference between a scholar who dead ends and a scholar who flies? Well, now what, you know, that what is it? What is it that makes the difference? Seems to me what we have a lot of an encouragement. It seems to me it's a holdover from another age or something. But there's been particular linear regression in the computer. It's made possible extreme specialization. And it's thought of as anything that's unique has to be very special. Yeah. And so they do, there's a term that they use in terms of geopolitics. They would divide and conquer the nations of Africa as a way of gaining influence or conquering them. They've divided and conquered the intellectual community by dividing it all up into very highly specialized things that they know everything about, but they can't think about the whole. Our political leader's not thinking about the whole. Right. Our intellectual leaders isn't, and there's a challenge that you could be addressing 
with your cross fertilization between the various meanings of what they call systems thinking, and that's what we're really called for, thinking comprehensively about things that links everything together as a pattern. We're very much on the same page. Mm -hmm. What I want to do is to show the range of folks. In, you know, first thing I want to do is to show the range of folks from the yeah. people who basically are interested in the antennae of one bug uh -huh. to the people who are thinking about the Silk Road, yeah. which is, you know, yeah. like the major link between China and the West That's over right. 10 centuries. Do you, think okay. you can, do you think you can draw a pattern from the particular to the comprehensive, or is that something that you get lost in the, con in the specialization? Is there a problem about over-specialization? Not only in academia, but in society in general. The CIAs will not talk to the uh, C, uh, the uh, the uh, you know any other agency. They have a hard time communicating tunnel vision. Something to do with you know that there's a problem of not. Al Gore has a very good film out now, or a very new book, where he's talking systems. He begins to think systems, thinking beyond just the political and that sort. All of the various disciplines are all divided, and the, and the academic community all divided down into a million different departments, a little bit subdivision, and that there should be a department at the university of everything. Well, Does that make any sense? It makes you? sense, but here's the way I want to spin that. Okay. It's a question, okay? It's a question how specialized things need to be. It's a question what you lose and what you gain as you focus in more. I want to raise it as a question. I've got an archive that should, should be Again, to help people who are studying, you know, lives of creative and thoughtful people uh -huh. figure this out. Uh -huh. And that's what I want to do. I want to, okay. have, I want to make a course where people can look at how various folks go at important stuff and figure it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're doing that. I think you're, and it's very interesting what you've done, the, the way you're doing it. I think it's really interesting. I'm glad you were able to put aside a little time so that we could get uh, this in. And thank you very much. So good talking. It's your pleasure to have a perception of, um, of a really interesting fellow in from Minneapolis by way of birth in Fargo, right in the middle of the country and all of that, doing very interesting things. Happy to have been able to share uh, his perceptions with you. His name is Peter Shea, or better known into the Congressetti, the Bat of Minerva, which you can do. And thank you for viewing, and uh, thanks a lot for coming in. All the best on your trip here, and let's continue talking like this over the time ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Now sit still until the camera goes down. You, know, you got to learn how to work with a camera. Okay, you got to learn that you don't just get right up like that. You no. have to. Oh, okay. okay. Tape okay. is over. Good job. Cake can't be over. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Okay, that's done. Yeah. Um. What? I don't know, it's probably over. Okay. Okay, good. Let's just make sure. Okay. Excuse me, excuse me just a second. I'll By all means. My next interview, I can push, I, I, I think without any problem at all, I can push it back a little bit. About you want? We got some eggs. Do you like deviled eggs? I like deviled eggs. Why don't, I, platter, why, don't, why, don't, why don't I push this back just a little bit? Why don't and that'll give, me, give, give us time to have a deviled egg. Yeah, okay. Hmm.